The UK's motorway system, like many across the world, is bustling with an almost constant flow of motorists. Motorists who are rightly more concerned with the road ahead of them than what is happening in plain view on the roadside. This lack of attention, along with very little human population living nearby, gives the criminal an opportunity to go unnoticed if approaching an unsuspecting stranded victim. This was probably never more apparent than in the harrowing case of Marie Wilkes, who was murdered on the verge of England's M50 during twilight hours in June of 1988. On Saturday, June 18th, 1988, pregnant 22-year-old Marie Wilkes was driving to her parents' home in Worcester with her 11-year-old sister Georgia and her 1-year-old son Mark. They were returning from a trip to an army cadet camp in the village of Simmons Yat in the Wye Valley, where they had visited Marie's husband, who was an instructor at the camp. Marie had only recently passed her driving test and had no intention of using the motorway, so she stuck to the country roads. On her way home, however, she became lost and had no alternative but to use the M50. But the Morris Marina she was driving broke down at the roadside, a short distance from an emergency phone box. There she called the West Mercia police, explaining her situation and telling them she was seven months pregnant and had two young children with her in the car. The time was 7.37pm. After making that initial call, she waited for a response from the police who had put her on hold whilst contacting her family, only to be told that the family car was in use by Marie's father and there was no way of reaching him as he was on a fishing trip. At 7.41pm, the police attempted to open the line again, only to be met with the eerie sounds of cars passing by on the busy road. They tried again at 7.44pm, again with no response. Shortly after this, a police car travelling from nearby Strenshaw service station noticed 11-year-old Georgia walking along the M50 hard shoulder, carrying the baby and looking for her sister, who had now vanished from the roadside. At the same time, the police operator contacted a breakdown service, asking them to get to Marie's car as quickly as possible. It was estimated that as many as 200 cars would have passed young Georgia and her one-year-old nephew. None of them stopped to help, although it was said that an unnamed man did speak to Georgia whilst she waited in the car for her sister. Could this have been Marie's killer before he struck? Meanwhile, the police officers who stopped for Georgia and the baby put out a radio message, stating that Marie was missing. When more police arrived to search the area, all they found was an abandoned car and a phone receiver hanging by its cord. At around 8pm, a police search helicopter using thermal imaging was sent to survey the surrounding area, but due to the hot weather that day, nothing was found. The search that followed involved 50 police officers on foot, but nothing was found until dawn the following day on June the 19th. That was when police found blood on and around the telephone Marie had used to make her emergency call. It wasn't until Monday, June the 20th, that Marie's body was found, partially covered with undergrowth, at the foot of a steep embankment on the side of the road. She was found close to the village of Strensham, three miles east of where her car had broken down. It was found that she had been stabbed in the right side of the neck and her jaw had been broken, thought to have been caused by a kick to the side of the head. There was evidence at the scene that a car had recently reversed behind the crash barrier. It's thought that this was probably done by her killer to somewhat mask himself from the passing traffic as he disposed of her body. There was also a 20 foot long tyre mark on the road above. The police had little to go on, so an appeal was launched on Wednesday June the 22nd by the Worcester Evening News and the Army Cadet Force for whom her husband was working. It would have been their third wedding anniversary. Soon after this, police released an artist's impression of the possible culprit based on a witness account by someone who said they'd seen a man near the scene of the crime on that Saturday evening. This led to the arrest of 32-year-old ex-soldier Edward Owen Browning at a social club in Pentray, South Wales, where he worked as a doorman. This happened after a tip-off from a work colleague who believed the artist's impression to be him. He was also basing his belief on the fact that he knew Edward Browning to be a violent man with a criminal history and that he knew he owned a butterfly knife, 
suggesting that it could have been the murder weapon. It soon came to light that on the evening of the murder, Browning had been travelling from his home in the Rhondda Valley in South Wales to Scotland after an argument with his wife, who also happened to be pregnant. This put him in the vicinity of the crime scene, as he would have almost certainly travelled the same length of the M50, going northeast towards the Scotland-bound M6. When he was eventually charged with Marie's murder, he insisted he was innocent, and had in fact travelled southeast that evening, using the old Severn Bridge and M5, not the M50. This claim was rejected. Travelling the route Browning claimed he did was not the natural choice, and would have added a good 30 miles to his journey. It was also found that one of the tyres on Browning's car had a bold patch, which raised suspicions because of the tyre mark left at the scene of the crime. On October 3, 1988, the trial began at Shrewsbury Crown Court, and seven days later, Browning was found guilty of murder and sentenced to a minimum of 25 years in prison. As mentioned previously, traces of blood had been found on the call box Marie had used, so it was accepted at the time that Browning abducted her after the stabbing, drove three miles and disposed of her body. If this was the case, there would surely have been traces of blood in his car, given the nature of the wound. But none were found according to forensic scientist John Hayward. When he appeared on the BBC Wells Week In Week Out programme in October of 1992, he said that it was unlikely that Mrs Wilkes was ever in Browning's car. He went on to say, Fabric car seats, even if thoroughly sponged, would still give a weak chemical reaction, indicating the presence of blood. With no forensic evidence to link Browning to the murder, the police linked him to the incident through CCTV videotape proving he did not cross the Old Severn Bridge that evening, as he claimed. An appeal was made against his conviction in May of 1991, but it was this video footage that saw it rejected. However, there was a revelation in 1992, when another, very different videotape was released. It sparked an investigation by the Police Complaints Authority and saw the case reopened. It came to light that the police had not disclosed a video in which Peter Clark, an off-duty police officer, was filmed four days before Mr Browning's arrest. Officer Clark said to the police that he had seen a silvery grey Renault pull over onto the hard shoulder of the M50's eastbound motorway on the evening of Saturday June the 18th. His hazy recollections ended there but he was put under hypnosis four days before Browning's arrest in an attempt to recall hidden memories from that day. The session was videotaped as Clark, under hypnosis, described a silvery-grey non-metallic, non-hatchback Renault car with chrome bumpers and the registration number C856HFK. But Edward Browning's car was a hatchback Renault with plastic bumpers. The registration number was C754VAD, so there were some potentially damaging inconsistencies as far as the prosecution was concerned. According to The Independent in 1992, Officer Peter Clark changed his evidence at the trial and described a number plate closer to that of Browning's car. The police also failed to disclose a statement from another witness about the car. The statement made no reference to a C registration, although it said that the same witness later provided evidence referring to this letter. This was thought to be encouraged by the police in order to force a conviction. As well as this, the less than reliable hypnosis video of Clark was omitted from the evidence given in court. It was decided that this evidence was deliberately kept from the trial by the police, and that if all evidence was given, and the inconsistencies were admitted, then the jury may well have come to a different verdict. So in May of 1994, a court appeal decided that the conviction was unsafe and Browning was released. Disciplinary proceedings began against a superintendent by the name of Anthony Stanley, who was accused of neglect of duty.
Following his release, Edward Browning blamed the eventual breakdown of his marriage on the stress caused by the wrongful conviction. He also encouraged Marie's family to seek out the truth from the police, saying that they had been lied to all along. He was later awarded damages believed to be in excess of £600,000. In September of 1999, a man by the name of Kenny Latton attacked Browning at his home in South Wales, beating him over the head with an iron bar, claiming that Browning had confessed his guilt to him at the time of the murder. Latton is said to have been the man who initially tipped the police off about Browning's guilt. During the fight, which was witnessed by Browning's wife, Latton was reported to have said, You admitted to me the night before you were taken in that you murdered that girl. Latton was later released without charge. It said that he received a £25,000 reward following Edward Browning's conviction, but Latton denies this. In May of 2008, the West Mercia Police issued a statement saying that a forensic review 20 years after Marie Wilkes' murder would take place, but a complete U-turn was made soon after when a spokesman for the police force denied that the case was being reopened but insisted that no cold case was ever truly closed and requested that anyone with new information should come forward. The events of that day in June of 1988 struck fear into female motorists, if not all motorists, up and down the country. But the eventual overturning of what once looked like a solid conviction was just added insult to an already heartbreaking story. <laughs> 